So our next speaker is uh, Professor Munji Bawindi, who uh, is a member of the chemistry department, the same as myself. And uh, Munji is a pioneer in nano uh, dots or nano crystals or quantum dots, as they're known by different names, and has really worked at this interface of, of uh, complex uh, materials and spectroscopy and applications throughout his career. And he's going to tell us about their relevance to chemical sensing and biosensing. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm going to tell you about um, using quantum dots in, in the sensing in a very broad way. And you've already heard a little bit about quantum dots or seen quantum dots. Um, quantum dots are small particles of semiconductors. They're about 2 to 10 nanometers in diameter. And when we started working on these things 25 years ago, or Lou Bruce and Sasha Efros, who really invented the field 30 years ago, I think they had no idea that today you would be able to go to, San, to Best Buy and buy a television that has quantum dots in them as the source of the green and red light in your, in your TV. But what I'm going to talk to you about is not the visible quantum dots that are already commercial, but uh, the absorption properties of quantum dots and also quantum dots that are in, the, uh, in what, we call the sh what is called the short wave infrared, or the, uh, the, the range between 1 and 2 microns. So there are two, two ways I'm going to talk to you about using quantum dots. And the first one is uh, the idea of using the, 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 the fact that quantum dots can absorb essentially in any uh, spectrum, uh, you can tune, this, the, tune the absorption spectrum in, 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 a, in, a, all, in a continuous way, uh, and how we can use that for creating miniaturized hyperspectral imaging. So, okay, so let me tell you a little bit about how this came about. When we think of a spectrometer, we think of a spectrometer as taking light, like a spectrum of light, running it through a grating or, or a, or a uh, prism, and, and spreading out the different colors of the light uh, on a sensor, an image sensor, a bunch of pixels or a CCD or something like this, and reading the intensity of each color in that pixel and recreating the spectrum this way. But there's another way to think of making a spectrometer, which is to take your, your light that's coming out. It could be reflected light from an, from an object, for instance, uh, from an apple or what, what have you. Um, and instead of running it through a diffraction spectrometer, to have on top of you, each pixel of your CCD here a filter. A filter that changes the, that is an absorption filter that selectively absorbs and only lets through a, a, a fraction, a, a specific fraction of the colors that are uh, from your object. All the information is contained there, so then it's a matter of reconstructing over an algorithm that then reconstructs, that takes the, takes the information, the intensity information from each pixel and therefore each filter and reconstructs uh, the information. And you can do this with dots in a, in a scalable way because you need to have a very large number of <coughs> ways of changing the spectrum of the, uh, of the object. Uh, let's say 200 ways, 200 uh, different absorption spectra that you want to be able to print. And I was very happy to hear the previous talk. You want to print little spots of, of 200 different kinds of quantum dots to recreate your, your object. And so the advantages of that is that you eliminate the, uh, the, uh, the moving parts of a spectrometer. You eliminate the, the grading and all these things. And now your spectrometer fits right on the imaging chip itself, which could be like, say, an iPhone camera chip. So a very small footprint. You can have video rate acquisition, and it can be very cost efficient. This is data that we've taken uh, with this concept. Uh, uh, these are the kinds of, it's hard to see here, these are transmission spectra of different kinds of dots. Uh, the black line here is the spectrum uh, uh, that was an arbitrary spectrum that uh, was created using, col uh, uh, using uh, color filters. And the, the, the dots are what, uh, the, uh, what our, our, our spectrometer recreated, and it was, very, uh, it, was, it was quite accurate. This is what it looked like. This is a very crude form. This was a, a small camera where you can see here on top of the, uh, uh, where we printed all, all these dots. Uh, but there's no reason why it can't be miniaturized even more. It's just that we didn't have the technology or the money, really, to do it at the time. But it, it can clearly be, uh, be further uh, uh, miniaturized. And where am I going with that? Um, where we want to go with that, or where we're going with that right now, is that we want to combine the idea of having a spectrometer in a small number of pixels in a very tiny area 
to form what's called hyperspectral imaging. That is to have the simultaneous acquisition of both spatial, meaning an image, and spectral, meaning information about the identity of whatever you're looking at at the same time. Basically sensing the environment by seeing it and identifying it pixel by pixel. So combining a camera that sees a scene with a spectrometer or a monochromator that identifies the different parts of the color of that scene to create an image where every pixel has a spectrum associated with it. That's not a new idea. It's called a hyperspectral imager. Um, and it can be used in a very large number of applications, environmental monitoring, agriculture, uh, identifying pharmaceuticals, um, medical diagnostics, remote sensing, uh, uh, planetary science. There are many places where you want to have an image and you want to know on this image, you know, what are the different parts of the image? You know, is the green that I'm seeing there, is that a plant or is that a tarp? Or, you know, is this, uh, uh, is this pill fake or is it real? Whatever, right? And so uh, the current technology, this, is a, this happens to be a NASA, uh, a, a, a NASA uh, hyperspectral imager, uh, tends to be heavy, expensive, and the acquisitions tend to be slow. What we're going after is something that's going to be very light, low cost, and that can be done in a snapshot. So your traditional hyperspectral imager, let's say you have a scene here, um, and let's say this is in the case where you want to do some, some, some let's say you want to, you're in, you're in I, I, either in the agricultural business or you're looking at forests or what have you. So you, you have a, a plane or a drone or something that flies around and takes an image of the scene line by line. So it takes a one line image and then for each point of that line, it creates a spectrum. And then it stitches up the total image line by line. So that takes time. You, know, you have to fly across and you slowly build up the image. And then for each line, then you create a spectrum and eventually you get your hyperspectral image. We'd like to do this in one go. We'd like to take a snapshot with our quantum dot hyperspectral imager. And then this is what it would look like, the, the array itself. It's a whole bunch of quantum dots that are spread in, in, in super pixels, each super pixel being the, the spectrometer, and then recreate the hyperspectral image sensing on a microscopic scale. Um, and we have very broad wavelength coverage. We can think about doing security applications. Planetary sciences is one of the applications we're going after now. Bioimaging, going into molecular spectroscopy where you can identify chemically the, the substances. And everyday living, everyday situational sensing covers all these wavelengths here, which, which is what we're going after. So this is one example of using quantum dots, not for the fact that they have beautiful colors that emit light, which is used in TVs, but for the fact that they also have really uh, very flexible uh, absorption spectrum that can be tuned depending on both their size as well as their composition. Let me shift, gear, shift gears now to a different way of using quantum dots, this time for fluorescent, but in a different part of the spectrum. That's gonna be this part of the spectrum here, the short wave infrared. And that's in biosensing or physics. Or, and I'm going to show you a couple examples of, of, uh, of this. And this is in the context of a broader push in my lab, a fairly recent push, of not just using quantum dots, but applying this wavelength range, the short wave infrared, which is right off the edge of silicon where in-gas cameras are, are needed to, to acquire images, um, which is highly underutilized in medicine, but I think can be broadly applied even without quantum dots. All right, so we, when we look at photonic technology in medicine, you've got the x-rays, you've got the ionizing radiation, which is well established. You have visual guides, you have fluorescence, you've got thermography in this area here, and, and what we're talking about here is this short wave infrared sitting right here. Um, the event, what's different about the short wave infrared compared to the visible or the emissive is that the short wave infrared, like the visible, is a reflective technology as opposed to the medium wave and long wave, which are emissive. This is where you do thermography. Uh, the short wave infrared, infrared absorbs, uh, uh, is absorbed differently than the visible. This is an apple, a bruised apple, which, can, which you can see much more clearly if you look at light in this wavelength range, as opposed to looking in the visible or even the near infrared. This is very clear. These are, these are uh, sensors on limited cameras, so I'm not inventing anything new here. This is well known. It's scattered less. Uh, this is the same image taken with a, uh, a silicon camera in the smoke here. 
and in this wavelength range. Again, this is taken from Sensors Unlimited. So there's, it's a, clearly a very different way of looking at the world if you look at this wavelength range. And in terms of biology, in terms of uh, imaging, and we're doing mostly in vivo imaging here, uh, this is a mouse here uh, imaged at different wavelength. It's just anesthetized and, and sitting there. This is autofluorescence, so we're, we're shining light on it, and this is the light that comes back. Um, if, the, if the room were darker, you'd see that there's actually a fair amount of light coming here, but by the time you get to 1,500 nanometers, there's no light coming back. That's because organic molecules don't really like to fluoresce in that wavelength range, and tissue is then very dark. So because of scattering being so attenuated and tissue being non-fluorescent in that range, that means that tissue can be, become essentially translucent in that wavelength range. So in this case here, what we've done is we've uh, taken quantum dots that emit in that wavelength range, around 1.3 micron, and we've injected them in this mouse, which is an SSIs. You can see right through, and then you can see the heart beating and the mouse breathing. What's really interesting, though, is that you can go really fast. You can take that same mouth and have it be happy in its cage in the dark and awake and interact with its environment, and you can now look at its response, its physiologi physiological response, its breathing and its heart beating as a function of, of many things. Usually you'd have to, put a, you'd have to put a foot pad or sensor or something like this. You'd have to contact to it to be able to, you'd have to disturb it to be able to know uh, how it's reacting to its environment. So we can go fast, we can see 550 beats per minute, 300, uh, uh, for the heart, five, 300 breaths per minute by looking at the liver going up and down. Um, and so this is one example where we, could, we would be able to, uh, to do this. This is another example of going, being able to see deep without scattering and fast in this wavelength range. And this is an example where we're looking at um, a, a mouse that has a, a little tumor growing in it. Uh, this is color-coded in time. The, the tumor was first imaged and then the then the veins were imaged, and then the arteries were, were imaged uh, using this. And uh, it's very light here. So is there any way to turn off these lights just, just very briefly? You no? The first person to play that. Yeah. OK, because what you, what you would see if you were able to, if this were darker, you'd see little bright spots of light flowing around really fast in this image here. This is the part of the brain that's, yeah, that's healthy. Yeah, we can see it. You can see it? OK. Yeah, you told us. All right, now if you look at the same thing on the other side, on the other side, you can see that it flows really differently. Like in this case here, you've got these bright plot spots that are going back and forth, so blood's not flowing. It's flowing very slowly here, right? That's the difference between the diseased state the, at the edge of the, of, the, of the tumor and the healthy state. So this is functional imaging of the flowing blood. So you can translate that and make a, make a flow image uh, where the color indicates the speed. And when you give drugs that what are so-called normalize the vasculature to make the diseased tissue look like the normal tissue, just because it looks like it morphologically doesn't mean that it functions the same way. So what you'd really like to do be is to, to take a snapshot of the function to see whether what you've recreated functions and, and, and flows and is able to deliver nutrients and drugs in the same way as normal tissue. So that's what we're going after. Okay, take drug, image this, and sense the flow. Um, another way is to do what, what we've done here is metabolic imaging. So this is uh, uh, tracking lipids, and there's uh, many diseases, for instance, uh, diabetes, obesity, metabolic diseases, where you want to know about what happens to the me metabolic fate of lipids. In this case here, we've created what are called chylomicrons mimics, which are basically of these, these quantum dots that are embedded in, oops, can we, can we start it again? Uh, let me see if I can. Um, OK. Um, and what we can do is we can image uh, the fate of these, of these lipids as we inject them in the tail. What happens to the liver, the kinetics of their met metabolism in the liver? The brown adipose tissue uh, is uh, in part of the neck here, which is sitting right here in the mouse here. And so we can see that as a function of time. And that tells us about the, the health of the metabolic health of this animal. And there are many diseases where you want to be able to give drugs and see how uh, the health of the, the, the total metabolic pathways uh, uh, non-invasively uh, 
uh, change as a function of the, of the delivery of the drug. Okay, this is, so this is a, a, a summary then. I've shown you something about using uh, 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 the, the fact that tissue doesn't scatter uh, and different applications of sh following the physiology, following the metabolism, and then following the flow of, uh, of in vivo uh, 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 aspects uh, for either drug screening for oncology, drug screening for metabolic disease, or just uh, looking at uh, how uh, an animal re responds to, to, let's say, stress in its environment. Thank you.